This vast wilderness in Namibia's central highlands is home to some of Africa's iconic animals. But this special place hasn't always been a haven for wildlife. Years of cattle ranching and hunting once decimated the numbers of native African animals. I'm Steve Leonard, and I'm here at the Arindi Game Reserve to follow the incredible story of a place that's been returned to the wild. This week, my vet skills are put to the test when we encounter a brown hyena. We try and obviously do an incision as small as possible. So this is the implant. And I go in search of the reserve's rarest mammal, the black rhino. the park's wild inhabitants. But there's one elusive creature whose top of the list of animals I'd like to see. A mysterious adult male leopard called Houdini, who has made one of his rare appearances around the reserve. Houdini was spotted on the western edge of the park where he dominates several female leopard territories. So leopard expert Natasha Dvoronin and I have baited a trap in the hope that we might catch him. If Natasha can collar him, then we'll be able to learn more about Houdini's secret life. We set a number of night vision cameras to record events after dark. That night, the black-backed jackal is first on the scene. He's picked up the scent of the rotting meat. This inquisitive scavenger feeds on carrion and often follows larger predators looking for scraps of food. Sure enough, a spotted hyena appears, but it doesn't take our bait. a glimpse of a more unusual animal. A nocturnal cat-like predator called a genet that stops by to check out the trap. visitor we've been waiting for. A leopard emerges from the darkness. It's not Houdini, and it's already been collared. Possibly sensing the trap, nothing takes the bait, and when we leave, the trap still stands empty. By first light, it's a different story. In the early hours, the trap was triggered. And I've teamed up with an old friend and park vet, Doe Grobler. Do you want this tailgate up? It's not a male leopard, but it is an animal that we want to follow. So Doe, the vet's here to put an implant inside it. I've never seen a brown hyena before. They're, they're not across the whole of Africa, are they? I mean, they occur in the harshest of places, like along the skeleton coast here in Namibia, where they just live off virtually anything they can find. I guess it weighs about 50 kilograms, 40 to 50 kilograms. That's um, a big animal. It's a kind of rottweiler, sort of yeah. big rottweiler size. 
Fitting the hyena with a radio tracking implant will give Natasha and the other guides their first real chance to study the life of this shy species. It's always exciting. I know that we're not looking at a leopard, but I think by following this female we're going to learn a huge amount, not only about brown hyenas, but the relationship between the different species. But first, we have to sedate it. The safest way is to deliver the dose of sedative in a dart using a low-powered air rifle. This is an extremely aggressive animal that could damage itself against the cage, so we need to be quick. This is the most stressful time for the animal, so I want to move in yep. through the door. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because this is the only time that they would actually really start biting things yes, and so on. Yes, yeah, yeah, potentially damage We really, teeth. yeah, so we want them yeah. out as quick as possible. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. It's a perfect shot. It's very impressive when you see somebody that skilled do a job like this. You know, in a situation like this, when you've got a potentially very stressed animal, you need somebody who can get in there and get the job done very quickly. It will take about five, 10 minutes for him to really settle down, but you can already see he's getting a little bit wobbly on his feet. And then pretty soon he'll just lie down and go to sleep. Now it's just a matter of waiting for the sedative to take effect. Doe and I set up a makeshift field hospital on the back of the jeep. Although the procedure is straightforward, this is a million miles away from my normal life working with cats and dogs in Shropshire. She's nice and stable, so we can work on her. I don't think she'll give us a problem. Good. All these drugs I remember from my farm animal days. This is a sort of combined wormer uh, parasite treatment. It's a sort of a payoff for, for the help that she's given us, is, is that obviously there's the stress of being caught and everything else, but in return, she's getting vaccinated for rabies and we're gonna treat these parasites, uh, that she's got these ticks and the internal parasites as well. So it's only fair, isn't it? Right. We try and obviously do an incision as small as possible. Yeah. Um, so that we don't have too much to close. Mm -hmm. The plan is to insert the radio tracking device into the hyena's abdominal cavity. So this is the implant. This is basically instead of a radio collar, instead of strapping something to the outside, we can pop this inside her abdomen. Now it looks big, but actually compared to what this hyena can eat, this is tiny and it doesn't weigh anything at all. It's got all the electronics that it needs to basically keep um, sending out a signal so Natasha can find this hyena for the years to come. I place the implant through go, the small right incision that Doe has made. There we go, that's lovely. Perfect. Very good. Just a few small stitches and the whole procedure is over in a matter of minutes. Uh, do you want me to grab those blood samples then? Yes, do that. Okay. Blood samples are taken and the superficial grazes on the hyena's face are treated. Do you want us to keep the needle? They're so like a dog, but they're not a dog. And the size of these front legs, these are from a Great Dane and these are from a... <laughs> Uh, a Labrador. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you can actually put the two next to each other. Just doesn't look right, does it? No. After less than 15 minutes, the hyena is ready to be released back into the bush. Last thing to do is reverse part of the sedative that we've given it. So this is the antidote to that. So we just pop that into the muscle. And she's got a very muscly neck. Rub that in. And we've just got to basically back off and... Uh, wait for it to come round. Might be another sort of five, 10 minutes. I'm very happy with the way the operation went uh, yeah. and she's looking good now. She's about to really wake up. It's a big responsibility to sort of, to, to do all of this. What you've done, very complicated work out here in the middle of the bush, I'm, I'm amazed. To us an animal like this is so vital and so important because mm. people like Natasha can follow them and, and tell us we learn we learn every day and that's i think that's the nicest thing about nature and being in a place like this mm. is we learn so much and uh, and and you know 
It makes you very humble in a way. A few moments later, the hyena comes round, none the worse for wear. From this point on, the reserve's wildlife team will get to know this hyena intimately. And the more species they can radio track, the easier it will be to build up an accurate picture of this special animal kingdom. Here in Namibia's spectacular central highlands, I've been given a unique opportunity to witness the lives of the Arindi Reserve's wild inhabitants. This incredible wilderness is a place of extremes. During the wet season, the rains move in with a force and speed it's hard to imagine until you've experienced it. This weather's fine if you're a water buck. It's not great for us though. The rains saturate the land turning the desert into a lush wilderness almost overnight. It's here in the flooded central plains that some seasonal residents have begun breeding. And wildlife expert Natasha Devoranen wants a closer look. Our quota here is between about 350, if we're lucky, we'll get 400 millimetres of rain. We're sitting over 400 millimetres already and we are two weeks into our rain season. So it's phenomenal. Across the park, the undergrowth is alive with a variety of rare frogs which appear in the wet season, each one making a distinctive call to attract a mate. What we've got is a, a two, three second troll. That's the banded rubber frog, so it goes. What we can hear, but further in the distance, we're not very close to one, over the troll. That would be a banded rubber frog, is the bubbling casinas which in the distance are going bloop, bloop. So what we're going to do is we're going to take what I call the owl method. We want to try and work out exactly where the frog is sitting. Now an owl's face is designed like a parabolic dish. So he can have the sound reflecting off his face and he's really lucky because one ear's up, one ear's down, one's forward and one's backwards. So he can triangulate the sound. It's not so easy for us. So with our hands. Mimicking an owl, Natasha tries to pinpoint the sound. In fact, I think the closest one is possibly just in the set of bushes here. No way, but that's amazing. Natasha's located a rarely seen banded rubber frog. That is absolutely amazing. If I could tell you the last time, apart from this season, that I saw a band of rubber frog was probably about eight or nine years ago, and I have never, never seen one call. We sit patiently like this if we're lucky enough to find one for hours at a time. And to have a little frog, frogs have personalities, I've decided. To have a frog brave enough to call right here while we've got the branches open and having a look at it, I think is pretty, pretty amazing. The rains may benefit the frogs, but the park has become covered with dense vegetation, making some animals extremely difficult to track down. In an undisclosed location in the centre of the park, where the bush is at its thickest, the rarest of all the reserve's introduced animals can be found. The black rhino is one of the most endangered big mammals on Earth, with only around 4,000 surviving across the whole of Africa. The tricky task of monitoring this elusive species is the responsibility of guide GP Brits. GP's camera traps not only help him locate the rhinos, they've recently recorded stunning images of them at one particular mud wallow. These magnificent beasts are still poached for their horns, which are prized in many cultures. And this reserve is one of a small number of safe havens in Africa for this critically endangered species. So going tracking with GP 
is a huge privilege. So you've got white and black rhino here in the reserve? Yes, we've got both species. Numbers, roughly? Um, yes, due to the poaching in South Africa, we're unfortunately not allowed to give out numbers. Oh, okay. Um, especially our black rhinos. Ah, right. Okay, so, so it is, it, it's no secret that you've got them. No, it's no secret we've got them, but yes. You, uh, keep, their number, you keep their numbers a secret? Yes. So yes. How, how many people know? How many people know yeah. how many rhinos is on Yeah, there? yeah. The guides must have a rough <laughs> idea. I think there's about three guides at the moment that's got a rough idea. Oh wow, okay, um, so it's a really, really well kept secret. It's a well kept secret. Where are we, um, where are we going to start? We know of a spot up by the mountains mm -hmm. where the rhinos like to hang out this time of year. We're going to head up there and see if we can find any fresh signs, fresh tracks. Maybe we're lucky enough to even spot one. Very good, that sounds great. Oh, this is a busy old spot, isn't it? Yeah, this is quite a nice spot, especially because it's in a thicket. Yeah. A lot of shy animals will try to use this. For example, the black rhinos often will come and use this for a wallowing spot. Okay, so what we have here is a nice body imprint. And as we can see, it looks like its head is over here oh, with okay. the imprint. It almost looks like a rhino's horns Yeah. over here with the yeah. bottom edge and the ear up here. And of course, the backside and the bum on the back there. You can see very heavy on the on the, yeah, yeah. On the hindquarters, rolling in the mud. So I know that, you know, this, this looks exactly like you would get with pigs and I know they wallow, but what's the reason for, um, for, for rhino wallowing, wallowing in holes like this? Usually the, the species with fewer hairs, um, much tougher skin, elephants do it, rhinos, as well as warthogs. Uh, okay. And they then will use this rubbing in the mud or rolling in it, the mud will cover the skin mm -hmm. and then they will use a rubbing post to rub off the mud which takes the external parasites ah, with the mud. Right, okay. So it's round here, that's what's caused this, the damage to these trees? Isn't yes, it? all of this. If you look at this tree as well, this is one of the main rubbing posts here. Caked with mud, aren't they? Yeah. And you can see up to how high oh, the yeah, mud yeah. is rubbed off, even oh, onto these branches. Is this the height of its back or, or a horn or...? Yeah, this is most likely its horn and its head okay. height. If you pick up pieces of mud that's been rubbed off, you might see some parasites in there. There's one tick over here. Is it? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is one of the smallest or smaller ones that you can find on oh, okay. them. Sometimes you find nice blue, right. oh, blue ticks yeah. on them that's about a yeah, yeah. centimeter, half, two centimeters. We know we're getting closer, but there's one big problem. All this green growth is hiding what is quite a large and very dangerous animal. None of them are radio collared in the reserve at all, so we can't find them with radio telemetry, so it's old fashioned tracking skills, which GP is excellent at. I'm hoping he's okay because I'm not going in to get him if he isn't. I climbed there up in a tree, but the bushes are thick, you can't really yeah. see much. It's disappointing news, but GP's well-developed instincts tell him that there are black rhino close by. But if they're startled, they'll often charge, so I remain in the vehicle, leaving GP to go in on foot. Then just 20 meters away, we catch a glimpse of a huge bull. It goes to show we were in the right spot, just when I thought we were never gonna see a black rhino. Do you know which one he was? Yes, this is a bull that I have identified before. I call him 007. Okay. Just because you, he's always there where you do not expect him. And he only acts two ways, either run, or you charge. No, so, it will charge a vehicle yes, or just yeah, definitely. a whole vehicle? Okay. Um, depends on what his mood is. Right, okay. So he, thankfully he was in the running away mood. Yes. So obviously there are other rhino here that are a bit more relaxed that we could potentially get more of a view of, but at least we've got to see one. See one, yes. No, there is a cow on a calf here that we've seen the tracks from before. Um, she's very, very relaxed. If we manage to find her, it would be awesome. 
and there's also another young bull that I call Shadow because the first time we saw him he came and fed in the shadow of the vehicle at about two, two, three meters from the vehicle. So if we can find him, it will be a double bonus. Yeah, but great start. And that was the last we saw of 007, who just melted away into the bush. The next time we caught up with the park's rhinos was a few nights later. When one appeared late at night down at a waterhole in the centre of the park. It's impossible not to be moved by these prehistoric looking creatures. Not only because of their size, but because of their history. Over the years, thousands of rhino have been slaughtered, and it's only because of projects like this that they're still in existence today.